Hi everybody, I'm JJ. You're watching Reality Survival. And today we're going to talk about um, a couple different, I guess I've got six different scenarios when, when looking at sort of what might be more likely, a uh, nuclear war or an EMP. Um, so I guess the thing that, that is interesting about this is that um, as preppers, we tend to um, we tend to focus on the worst possible scenario. <laughs> We're sort of catastrophists in in, in a way of speaking, and um, and so a lot of people just go right to the worst possible scenarios. And there's a lot of people out there right now that are really concerned and really worried about the fact that um, you know that there could be some sort of a nuclear Armageddon, okay? And I wanted to do this video to talk about some different possible scenarios because to try to help folks not be so consumed with this. Um, it, it's really a very, very low likelihood that there's going to be an all-out nuclear war. And so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the the least likely things and work towards the more likely things, just in my opinion. You know, this is just my opinion. Um, everybody has an opinion on it, and I could certainly be wrong. I'm not saying that I'm right. Um, I'm just giving you my opinion. That's it. So, so the first the first thing. Um, now I've got some notes that I made here just to try to keep it somewhat. <laughs> you know, consistent and cogent, I guess. Um, an all-out nuclear war exchange is not very likely. And the reason is, is there's no winners. You've got mutually assured destruction, very few possible human survivors. Um, and, and the thing is, is too, and like a lot of people in the videos that I've done on the nuclear war survival series, uh, playlists that I did, people will, will say, oh, you're, you're giving people false hope. Well, I'm not giving people false hope. I'm just, I'm only, t when I give you this information about in these videos, I'm really talking about a limited exchange. Uh, in a full out, all out nuclear war where all the missiles are flying from all the countries all over the place, there ain't gonna be very many people that are gonna survive that long term, if anybody. Um, and and so there's no point in trying to do any survival videos about that, right? Because uh, it's pointless. So all the videos that I've done, and I recommend, if you guys are worried about this, I recommend that you go back and take a look at these videos because it's, it's talking about a limited exchange. And, and that's, a, that's a more likely scenario, I think. In my opinion, there's about a 0% chance of an all-out nuclear war happening. I don't think it's very likely at all um, because the people who are in power, they would like to stay in power. That's the one human thing <laughs> that you can be sure of. They, they enjoy living the life that they live, having the power that they have, and they, they all understand that if they go there, everybody loses. Okay, and uh, it's just it's just very unlikely. So the next scenario that is a little bit more likely would be a limited exchange between the U.S. and Russia. Now, I think this is also highly unlikely, but it's far more possible than a full exchange. And in this kind of situation, we might be talking about <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we might be talking about two or three major cities on each side. You know, um, there there is tons of different um, reasons why this could be a potential option, um, and and it's mostly because it's. It, it doesn't ensure the end of the human race, uh, you know. So, uh, in my opinion, <coughs> sorry, I got Omnicron, Omnicold. Uh, 
I think this is probably still only like a one to two percent chance. I think it's very, very unlikely. Um, the world, the world economy. If this happened, the world economy would crash. World War Three would 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 be completely full on, as in um, uh, a full engagement. You know, not not a proxy war or a cold war kind of thing like we're seeing now. But it would be, it, it would it would be all out, um, and it would be a long and, and bloody battle that would follow. Now, and obviously, if if something like that happened, then it there obviously would be it could be a potential catalyst for additional civil unrest here in the states and and in Europe and and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, every, everything would 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 get sort of the apple cart would get turned over as it were <laughs> um, and again this is the reason why I think that this is so unlikely to happen because it falls back to human greed and and you know our leaders people wanting power there's no guarantee that the people who are in power now would be at in power at the end of all that and so it's pretty unlikely We'll move a little bit further down the list here of things that are a little bit more likely. And number three, and that would be that Russia launches a hypersonic missile armed with a nuke, and they set that to a high altitude detonation in the United States. Now, in order to get the maximum EMP effect, they, they would set that, you know, to detonate high up. The ranges depend on what the what you want the effect to be, but somewhere in the estimation of, you know, 250, 300 kilometers or something like that. And that would, uh, that would cause the entire grid to go down, or, potential, or at, least, at least most of it, if not all of it. Um, now, I think that's more likely than the previous two, and it has a distinct advantage of allowing the population to kill themselves off in mass chaos. And I'll do another video talking about kind of what we should expect in the aftermath of an EMP. Um, the downside is is that the response in kind uh, would would be in kind, and it would pro possibly be applied equally across the whole globe. Um, again, there's no real winners in this scenario because it is an act of war, and it would be taken as such, and um, their response, you know, they would be in the same situation that we are, um, in a very short order, probably. But the upside to that is, is that the planet wouldn't get destroyed. Um, a lot of people would die in a pretty short amount of time. And, uh, but human civilization would be rebuilt and would continue to go on. Um, but both governments would lose power because neither one would be able to maintain control over their populations. They wouldn't be able to do it. Um, their, entire, their entire economy, the entire system would collapse beneath them. Now, I think this type of scenario probably only has somewhere in the neighborhood of a 5% chance of happening. Um, maybe, even, maybe even three. I don't know, three to five percent, somewhere in that range. I'm, and I'm just assigning these numbers just to give you an idea of kind of where I, I feel like they fall on the scale. I, I don't really, there, there's no scientific backing here. Um, this is, you know, just again my my thoughts on the matter. All right, so number four would be a little bit more likely. And that is a limited exchange between Russia and NATO countries in Europe, probably the UK or France. Um, this is starting to get to the point of being uh, considerably more plausible, I think. I don't think the U.S. would get involved, though, if we are not attacked. And I understand that we're a member of NATO and that we, would, we, would, we are supposed to respond. But I don't think we would because I don't think we'd have a dog in that fight and I don't think we would want to take the chance of uh, starting something more serious. Here's the problem with this one though. 
the prevailing winds in Europe tend to run from west to east across much of Europe. Um, the target would probably have to be something like London. Um, they probably wouldn't do it in Ukraine because the fallout from the nukes uh, in Ukraine, if it was set to a typical type detonation that, you know, for, for destroying cities and infrastructure and everything, um, it would likely end up contaminating Moscow and a ton of Russian farmland. And so they probably wouldn't do that. Um, there, it's going to be a self-defeating kind of thing if they did that. Um, a target, you know, more likely would be London or Paris, uh, and that would probably be far enough away to minimize some of the fallout for Russia, um, most of it, I guess. And um, but this obviously triggers full-scale war with NATO, um, and so that's a huge risk. That's a huge risk for Russia, especially considering the fact that they're underperforming um, by a very large margin in Ukraine right now. So I put this one at about 7% or so. Um, Putin knows that this would, this would also ruin any chances of him staying in power. So, again, it's, it's just it's not real, real likely. Number five on the list is... A low-yield tactical nucle nuclear detonation over Kiev. Now, this this one would be set at a detonation uh, at an altitude high enough to minimize fallout, but low enough to cause major infrastructure damage localized to Ukraine. Uh, this is maybe a little bit more plausible or probable, and it it offers Putin a decisive victory in Ukraine without involving the NATO or U.S though he would have to deal with a never-ending insurgency. Um, the Ukrainians, it would, it would galvanize the Ukrainians to fight against him forever. They, he would never, he would, it would be death by a thousand cuts. Um, and he knows that that could potentially bleed him dry. So I put this one at about 10% likelihood and, and I would say that they would probably only do this if Russia felt like they had no other options to win. If they were backed into a corner, they were running out of munitions, they didn't have a lot of other tactical options, they had you know, used up a lot of their um, um, missiles and, and artillery and you know, all, all those kinds of things. And they were just getting to the point where they felt like this was the only thing that they could do to bring everybody to the negotiating table to get them what they wanted. Um, <clears throat> I think that that option for, for the Russians would probably be preferred rather than losing face and revealing to the world that they were no longer a superpower. Because that's essentially what would happen if they, if they lose this engagement. So, I'm sitting about a 10%, 10% or so there. Um, number six scenario is what I think would be the most likely scenario, and that would be a low-yield tactical nuclear detonation set to go off at an altitude that would produce an EMP over central Ukraine. Uh, this would be designed to kill all the power in Ukraine, but not specifically, not, not significantly spill into other European and NATO countries. Now this would mean this would minimize fallout. It would cause chaos in Ukraine. Um, the Ukrainian government would probably uh, crumble pretty quickly. Uh, the chaos wouldn't be as bad as it would be in the USA um, because the rest of Europe would be there to help and to help rebuild the grid. But this would be a strong enough attack to bring the Ukrainians to the negotiating table pretty much immediately because the internal situation would be so dire that they would not be able to deal with anything that Russia was doing. Um, the thing is, the psychological value of this, seeing Putin, you know, seeing that he is willing to detonate a nuke would shock the world to its core and he would take control of most of eastern Ukraine, if not all of it. Um, 
he would probably only want the eastern part because the rest of it is going to be it's going to be in chaos. Um, I would put the chances of this happening somewhere in the 12 to 15 percent range. Uh, if he sees that continuing a protracted ground war is going to be too costly and it might cost him to lose the confidence of the oligarchs who are currently supporting him, he could potentially see this as an option. Now, let me just say that these are just six scenarios that I came up with at like 1 o'clock in the morning the other night <laughs> when I'm sitting around watching YouTube. And um, there's a lot of other things that could potentially happen. There's obviously biological and chemical. There's uh, directed energy weapons. There's, you know, um, you know all, all different kinds of potential weapons that are out there that could, could you know, sonic weapons. There's all, all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but I just wanted to keep this basically to the realm of, you know, nuclear weapons and EMPs because that's the thing that seems like everybody wants to talk about, you know, that, um, everybody's kind of all excited about it and they're, and they're worried about it and everything. Um, I know that a lot of people have the feeling, I was talking with a friend the other day and he said, you know, I think a lot of people just have the feeling that they want to do something because they feel like that a lot of this is out of their control, right? And that's what preparing is all about. That's what, that's what you know, disaster preparedness is, is it's trying to take some steps now to minimize impacts later so that you can perpetuate normalcy for the people that you love in a bad situation. Um, so if you wanna get some food, you want to buy some food that's that's probably a good idea to have some extra food to stock up your pantry you know if you want to have um, the ability to to gather transport and filter water and make it potable that's probably a good idea if you want to have self-defense items to protect your home in case of civil unrest that's that's probably a smart idea um, doing the basics you know of all the of all the preparation is is intelligent even when we're not facing a nuclear war, right? There's um, everybody in the 80s, you know, if you grew up as a kid, um, if you're my age or, or older, you, you probably remember the Cold War and what it was like in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I remember more of the 80s. But uh, we lived under the threat of the nuclear war all the time and life went on. You know, people continued doing their things. People went to work still. People, you know, they didn't panic and they didn't go out and spend a bunch of money, you know, needlessly on, on uh, bunkers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't do a few things to prepare uh, just to make your chances a little bit better in case something did happen, right? And that's, that's kind of what, all, what this channel is all about, is I've, I've talked to you guys about reasonable, practical steps, things that you can do to make yourself a little bit more prepared in case something bad does happen. Now, I'm probably the worst salesman in the world because <laughs> I've sat here and I've told you about these things and I'm telling you that I don't think that they're very likely. Um, but... Part of the way that, that I continue to run this channel is through affiliate programs and all that kind of stuff. And so I am an affiliate with EMP Shield. Um, EMP Shield is a device that you can install on your car, you can install on your house for your whole house generator, for your solar systems, uh, for your ATVs, for your tractors, those kinds of things. And if there was an EMP detonation here from either a coronal mass ejection from the sun or uh, from a high altitude nuclear detonation, they will protect those items to keep them so that they'll run. So for example, with your car, if you happen to be out and about somewhere and an EMP collapses the grid, then your car is still gonna run. Now, it depends on the sources that you listen to as to, you know, whether or not it's likely that your car will run after an EMP. Some people say hardly any cars will be affected and they'll all run. Other people say not one damn car on the road will run. 
the congressional study that, that, that I've looked at, I think it said something around 60 to 70 percent of vehicles will have some sort of a, a problem, either will not run or won't be running correctly. I don't know. I don't know. But for me, I'm go, I'm, I've got another EMP shield for my wife's vehicle, which I'm going to put on this weekend. Um, I've got an EMP shield in my truck. My son's got one on his truck. Um, I think it makes sense. It's it, they're easy to install. They're only three wires, and if if something happens when you're away from home, at least you'll be able to get home. Now, a lot of people say, "Well, you'll become a target because you have a running vehicle." <laughs> well, here's the thing, and, and I'm going to do a video talking about this a little bit more. But in the first couple hours, everybody's going to be confused. But you, having the knowledge that you have because you watch this channel and other channels like this, will know what happened, and you will be able to immediately get home. Yes, it's going to be a little difficult. Yes, you'll have to use some back roads and all that kind of stuff. And it's not going to be like you're going to be able to fly down the highways. But um, you're not going to see roving gangs blocking the road and all that kind of stuff within the first couple hours. That's just not going to happen. Um, with your house, if you have an EMP shield in your house, everything that's plugged into your house grid will be protected. So that means if you have a backup power system, then you'll still be able to use the stuff that's in your house, like your refrigerator, your freezers, those kinds of things. Those are important. Now, will having power make you a little bit more of a target? Well, of course, yeah, in a bad situation when there's a lot of chaos, then yeah. But if you use it discreetly and you're smart about it, um, it's going to give you a huge advantage to be able to still keep the food that you have in the freezer. Because there wouldn't be any more food coming to <laughs> coming to grocery stores, so you want to use all that you can. And you want to make sure that you keep all that food as good as long as possible. Um, now it's going to be an EMP situation like that would be a long-term situation, and there's lots of other things that you're going to have to work through. And we've talked about those in other videos, and we'll talk about more of them in the future. But you know, if you feel like you just want to do something to make your chances a little bit better than everybody else. Go to empshield.com, check out the different devices they have, get one for your vehicle, get one for your house. If you've got like an ATV or UTV or something like those, I'd say get one for them too. Um, use the discount code Reality Survival, and it'll save you $50 per unit. Okay, that's, that's a pretty good discount. Um, you're doing something. Right. There's other things you need to do. You can go to AmericanPreppingAcademy.com. You can go see all the, the full lessons that I've put out there on all the basics of disaster preparedness. If you work through each one of those lessons and you do all the things that are talked about in each one of those lessons, you're going to have a way better understanding of disaster preparedness and it's going to give you an idea of where you're at in the, in the process. Okay. Um, all the basics are over there. Okay, you, you know, all, all, all the main stuff that you need. Um, and we'll be adding more to it. If you guys, if you guys like information like this, if you like these, these sort of thought projects to kind of get you thinking and, and um, you know, spinning your wheels on disaster preparedness, I would appreciate it if you subscribed. And uh, go to realitysurvival.substack.com. Sign up on the email list over there. That is going to allow me to send you an email every time I upload a video. Uh, that way you'll, you won't miss any content and uh, it'll give you a notification. And then for the uh, weekly uh, Intel briefs, I'm going to start doing those on Thursdays and Sundays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, we we'll do two a week and that's, that's, the, that's the goal anyway. And those will be on news stories and things that are going on in the world that I think might potentially affect your prepping. That's going to be the, the, uh, the goal for most of those live chats anyway. Um, if we don't have anything particularly interesting in the news and I can't find enough links to generate, then we'll just talk and, and kind of go back and forth and, you know, you guys can ask me questions, what my thoughts are and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and we'll kind of just go back and forth. So, Anyhow, uh, hope you enjoyed this, and if you got any questions, you can put them in the comments below. I'll do my best to, add, to answer them. If you want to know more about EMPs, 
what the effects are, how they work, all that kind of stuff. I've got a playlist on EMPs. Go to the channel and check that out. If you want to know more about nuclear war survival, um, go to the nuclear war survival skills playlist and check that out. And you got to watch them all. You really need to see them all because the videos are kind of specific in their topics and, and they address, they kind of build on each other and address a wide variety of, of different things. So uh, check those out. And if you got any questions, put them in the comments in those videos. And I'll do the best to answer them I can. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to live six Ps. Proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. Stay safe.